Okay, so I will start from now. So uh, thank you everyone again to show the uh, consistent interest for the topic. And um, uh, I'm happy that um, I can share some uh, insights from the first lecture about how high dimensional data can be used uh, or specifically the tensor form can be used for the smart transportation area. So today, we will talk the same domain is still the smart transportation, but we will talk about a different type of methodology, which is deep learning. So we will start from the same uh, three domains that um, the static data, for example, flow, speed, and rate for different type of task, and the dynamic data. Finally, we will talk about trajectory today and some related tasks such as representation learning and the trajectory uh, recovery. And the last is the traffic management. Um, we will specifically focus on the traffic signal control, this uh, application. So we will start from the first. Um, the again, and this is what we are familiar with, the traffic static data. We will start from here first. So last lecture, we talked about the traffic flow inside of the public transportation, the metro stations, how it looks like. So we, all our models is based on the really nice spatial temporal patterns we introduced last lecture. So now if I show you that, okay, if we move to another data set, this is the speed data set in the road network, specifically in the highways. You can see that the pattern is not as clear as this one anymore. For example, you can see the speed is always maintained a specific level. For example, six kilometers per hour can make sense. It only drops significantly if there's a congestion. So this type of data is not stationary at all anymore. So, and we don't see a really good pattern. So now is the problem that Okay, when we move to a new data set, do we need to rebuild the model from scratch again for this new data? Um, if yes, then it's gonna be too complicated, right? So this is the problem that, okay, we have the flow data, we have different bunch of the tasks, for example, prediction, imputation for missing data or anomaly detection. For example, last one, last lecture, we built the prediction model or if we want to do imputation, do we need to build a new model for that? Uh, for example, we call it flow imputation model. If we do anomaly detection, we get another model, right? This is for the flow data. Then for the speed data, do we need to create another three specific model for the three tasks? And also for the trajectory data, do we need to build another three models? So, does it has to be this complicated that the numbers of the models is basically how many type of data times how many tasks we want to do? So it doesn't have to be this way. So it doesn't have to be this complicated. And this will be a good opening of and a good motivation of uh, the fundamental uh, concept of the uh, deep learning that. Um, we are trying to learn a universal or robust high level uh, representation of the data. So um, we start from a really um, classic or really famous example that this is the handwriting and this is zero, this seven, two. So what is representation? So it's basically we, for example, we put this uh, zero into a convolutional neutral net, uh, neural network. Uh, if you don't know what's this, it's fine. Uh, we will know it later. Um, and if, because those two are both zeros, so it should have be close together in the vector uh, space, which means in the uh, embedding space. And these seven and two, they are different numbers. So they should be far away from the vector space. So this is the basic assumption. Same number, same class, then similar embeddings, different than dissimilar embeddings. So here, uh, the embedding 
is basically means um, the representation. So I will interchangeably use the two terms. So um, how can we achieve that? This is only intuition. Mathematical wise, we can write it this way, that this Z is the embedding we get after the C and after the convolutional network. So um, if they are from the same number, if they are the same number, then we want to maximize their similarity and then minimize the loss, right? If they are different, then we um, minimize their similarity. So this is method, method, uh, mathematical wise, we formulate this way. So uh, once again, this term representation can be really abstract. So what is exactly a representation? So here I will switch to a demo. Um, can you see the screen that we are switched to another demo? Yeah, yeah, we can see the screen. Okay, good. So this is um, an open um, um, uh, environment for the uh, convolutional neural net network. So basically convolutional neural network is that we have a pixels, for example, three times three pixels, and we go through uh, left to right, top down to go through the, um, um, uh, the pictures. And then we, this three times three pixels or windows is basically the weight. So we translate this image into some, um, these kind of representations. And after several layers, for example, con con convolution layer, ReLU, um, pooling, and uh, just like uh, the Lego uh, toy toys that just stack all different components, then we can get the last, this kind of really high dimensional super weak uh, vectors. It basically uh, stands for some high level features, for example, the curves or the patterns pixels of the image. So this is the representation, uh, speaking of the image data set. And by getting this representation, we can do some uh, really interesting tasks. For example, the image recognition, this is a car, this is a truck, this is a ship. Yeah, so this is a toy example to understand the representation. So now I switch back to the slides. So uh, this is high level um, representation can be the answer. So now we call this from the same number, from the same class, the positive samples and those different, we call it negative uh, samples. So this is uh, first we name this way, okay? So now if we uh, formulate it officially, so there are gonna be three important steps to achieve this. Uh, for example, this one, because we know it's zero and seven too. So that's why we can do this positive and negative. But in a large data set, how do we know which each two are positive, which each two are negative, right? So how do we achieve that? So the first step, we can do one technique called data augmentation that we have the original image and we do all different kinds of recolor, adding noise or clop or flip. So all different kind of um, tricks to get the augmented data set. And then we fit in the original one with the, with the uh, augmented one, fit into the same uh, CNN uh, machine, uh, machine, and then we can get the vectors for these two. And because they are from the same cat, so they are positive samples. So we put them similarity uh, close to each other. So, which means if another image is not from this cat, for example, is from the elephant, then the similarity will be super low, right? So this similarity, we can easily formulate it as cosine similarity. So once again, for example, this is our the, the, the sample we look at, and this is the, negative samples because it's not from generated from this cat. And this is positive, positive samples because it's basically generated from this, uh, this parent image, this cat. Mm, so uh, we write, on, uh, write it down this way that, okay, our loss function is basically maximize the similarity 
if the two images are from the same um, augmentation original image and divided by all the data pool. So this is like the softmax um, uh, term. So this is basically the three steps. And we have a nice uh, official name for this technique. Specifically, it's called contrastive learning. And it belongs to a um, new type of training scheme called self-supervised learning. And it's known, it's really well known because you can learn a more robust representations without labels. As you can see here, we don't have any labels that this is cat, this is cat, so they are positive. We just generate the more data by the augmentation so that we only use the data itself to supervise the, the model itself. So that's why it's called self-supervised self learning. And this representation we learned can be directly used uh, in various downstream tasks so that we don't need to um, build up different models for different tasks anymore. So we will have some um, uh, paper demonstrations about this, this point. So now the question is, uh, back to our transportation domain, can we do the same to the time series data? Which means that, okay, these two time series, they look really similar. Can we do the same that we put them close in the um, embedding space? And if it looks, another one looks really different, we put them far away uh, to this green two doors. Can we do that? The answer is yes. So, but the question is uh, how, how can we do that? Um, how can we do that is based on a really fundamental assumption that, okay, uh, we look at the time series. For example, some we, uh, we want to do the prediction the uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, we don't see it. And some part is missing. So we also don't miss, uh, don't, don't observe that. Uh, why we can do that? Because um, no matter what the task is, um, prediction, imputation or anomaly detection, no matter what the task is, our basic assumption is that our unobserved patterns should be, um, by, by default, should be um, consistent. And the unobserved patterns should be consistent with the observed patterns so that we can learn the embedding from the observed one and use it for the to, to describe the unobserved one. Okay. This is the basic assumption. So um, before we really introduce the technique, so first I will also introduce uh, this type of training is also called pre-trained model, pre-training. And it's a really beautiful idea concept. So why? Because for example, we have all the data um, from last lecture. The pre-training means that we, we fit this data into a more general trend model. For example, a pre-trained model, the output of the model is not to directly imp, uh, to predict something. Instead, it's just trying to learn a representation, a vector, super, uh, super abstract. And by using this vector, no matter what our down downstream task is, uh, prediction, tiny point detection, imputation, classification, no matter what the task is, we just need to build a, build a really small model, for example, a small tiny regressors or cosine similarities or some max pooling small layers to fine tune the, the downstream models so that we can achieve the task. And most of the time, we can achieve better um, performance than the well delicated models. So this is called a pre-trained model. And so um, a quick recap so far that we mentioned the contrastive learning. So this is first uh, proposed by uh, the team from the Google research. And this has been a really impactful research uh, work in the computer vision area. So uh, basically, a uh, quick recap, you generate the augmented data. If they are from the different samples, then it's the negative, we put far away. If it's same samples, then we put it 
uh, close to each other. So um, a quick recap as well, that um, we have three key elements or steps. We do the data augmentation to generate positive pairs. And we need to define what's the positive pairs and negative pairs. And we need to define the loss, right? So um, now the question is, how can we apply all this um, good framework into our transportation domain? How can we de design the data augmentation for time series? How do we define positive and negative pairs? And how do we formulate the loss for traffic domain? So I will start from three examples. And the three examples has been a, a really impactful papers in this field. So the first one is from a really uh, impactful company as well, and DeepMind. And they published uh, in 2018, it's called uh, CPC, Contrastive Prediction Coding. Uh, but the name is to do the prediction. So the data they use is the uh, voice speech data. So this is the speech wavelength. So they chunk it into the different block from uh, XT minus three, for example, until now XT. For example, now we are at XT. So first they will use some encoding uh, models, for example, RNN or LSTM to get the embedding vector. So now here the ZT is already the embedding high level vectors we introduced before. And here they used another auto regressive layer that it capture all the history information up to now. Okay, so here the CT basically means all the contextual history information all the way up to now, up to XT. So here this CT has our all histories. Now we want to do the prediction, right? So right, how so do we do the prediction? So, so yes, it's GNG. Uh, for, for the original data, it's xt minus three, xt minus two. What are the interrelationship between these different segments? Uh, you, you, uh, what, uh, sorry, what do you mean by the interrelations? You mean why we cut like, this way? Or? Like, like this uh, one person talk continuously and you put every five seconds as one segment. All this, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like every 10 seconds. Yeah, for example. It's the same person talk. Yeah, the same person, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. I, 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 I forgot to introduce the, the, the data setting. Yeah. So basically it's from the same person, but we chunk it every 10 seconds. And how to select the window lens is also an arch that we need to do the parameter tuning. Yeah, so now back to here, the CT is basically the information from all the history. Now we wanna do the prediction. So now here is the tricky part that, um, um, and here is also how the augmentation comes that um, we randomly draw some, uh, uh, some, uh, some chunks from the, um, uh, when we are training, okay? When we are training, we mix one real prediction, the label, the Y, we mix one real Y with other, non why the the not the not real prediction together we mix them together but we don't know which one is the real um prediction which one is the real ground truth so we mix them together and we don't tell the model which one is the real prediction um so this is the other three is basically from the random draw so that we train the model um by this loss we want to maximize the similarity between, for example, the case one, T plus K is our real prediction, but we don't know what the K is. Maximize the similarity between the X, T plus K and our history context, CT. And minimize the difference, uh, minimize the similarity uh, of others. So by such, we have only one positive samples, which is the real prediction, and the rest is uh, the fake one we added in augmented insight. So this is the uh, this uh, core design of this uh, CPC model. 
So if you uh, if this makes sense to you, then we can move to the next work. Oh, by the way, so this one is called um, uh, uh, for short is called info NCD that you only have one positive samples and the rest is a uh, negative samples. So if no problem, then we move to the second uh, case that uh, this kind of scheme can be also be used for the change point detection. So the basic assumption for change point detection is that, okay, before and after the change point, the data behavior is different now, right? It, it, the data behavior changes. So this is the change point. Um, so um, back to this scheme, the contrastive learning, how do we do the augmentation? So we do this way. So this history is X1 and the future and uh, next to it, Y1, we call it is the positive pass. And we go through the X1, Y1 to X2, Y2, X3, Y3. So it's like moving, sliding windows. So we generate a bunch of uh, the pairs that uh, this is the positive pairs for X1 all the way to XK. And for the rest of the Y, for example, for uh, X1, Y1 is positive and y, Y2 all the way to YK is negative samples. So here we define the uh, positive and negative samples this way. And the loss is the same loss uh, based on the previous paper. Uh, it's the info NCE that uh, we have only one positive samples here if it's the it's real future and the rest is non-fixed uh, future. So it's the negative pairs. So this is the um, soft max. And in the end, they write it as a cross entropy loss. So basically maximize the difference, uh, maximize the similarity between these two and um, minimize the similarity between history and the negative samples. So we talk about the representation and it can really learn really good representations. We will uh, give three uh, examples. So this is the three positive pairs. You see in the pair one, we have the blue, uh, green line and the um, black line. This is the original data and they are positive pairs. And you can see their representation is a lower dimension. It's captured the main feature. Um, you can see the representation is really quite similar, right? For the second pair and for the third pair, their representations indeed still quite similar. And for the negative pairs, this is the original data and you can see the representation now is quite different. Okay, so here is the, they, they can use this representation, okay, for history and the representation for future XP plus one. So these two representations, if their cosine similarity is smaller, smaller than a specific value, which means, okay, change points happens. So that's their logic to detect the change points. So, so yeah, so yeah, yeah. in this uh, problem setting, do you assume uh, the data is uh, available from beginning to the end, but we don't know which point there's a cha point change. Is that yeah, right? exactly. So yeah, that's the correct. So it's not online real time uh, chain detection is uh, you have this uh, historic data and uh, already there, but you want to see when a process change occurred. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so this so far is not an online uh, detection that uh, we can know, predict where it's going to happen uh, of the speaking of the change point. But uh, here is more like uh, offline. Yeah, that would be to guess, uh, to, to find out in the historical data where the change point happened. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, that's also a really good question. I never th thought about this way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So this is uh, how the self-supervised learning and contrastive learning can be also applied in the change point detection. So the last work I would like to share is fulfilling what I promised the pro-train model that I, for different tasks can 
can all have the good performance gain. So this is um, the paper uh, recently, a recent paper called a time series to vector. Basically means they want to uh, embed this time series into a vector. So this setting is similar to our MTR setting that we have different uh, instance and in our MT, uh, in our metro is different stations. In their case, it's different instance. So they do the time series setting and uh, time series contrast in this way. So the first step is we run them crop, uh, crop to neighboring overlapping um, windows, the red one and the green one. So we can get a two sub set of the um, time series we put into the same encoder and then we get the representations, right? So, so for the, for the two, uh, so these two, first we will call it, uh, they are the positive pairs because they have a huge overlap. And for the over, um, and for the generated positive, uh, positive pairs, we will do another kind of um, data augmentation technique to mimic if some part of the time series is missed so that how do we learn a more robust way that for example this is a two contact and if this part is missed so the exactly at the same time the same uh, on the uh, counterpart the positive counterpart the same time stamp this one is the positive samples for the missed one and vice versa if this one is missed then this one is the positive um, pairs. So it has these two ways of defining the, um, defining the augmentation, okay? So this is in the time series uh, to contrast this way. And in the instant wise, uh, it's quite straightforward for the instant wise. If the two time series are from the same instance, then they are positive pairs. If they are from the different instance, then they are the negative pairs. So basically, if it's the same instance, then it's the positive. So how do you write down the, the loss? So again, you can see this is the info NCE loss because we only have one um, positive pairs. So in the time wise, if they are at the same time point, then it's positive, otherwise it's negative. For the instance wise, if they are uh, from the same, uh, instance, then it's positive, otherwise it's negative. And in the end, uh, the loss is basically the weighted sum of these two loss. And this is the representation they learned, the same model, but for different, uh, three different models, uh, three different data set. You can see here in the screen type, we have some um, outliers maybe, or, or some different pattern here. So we also have a spike in the representation. And here in this data set, you can see the gradual change and in the rep representation, we also see the grand gradual change. Here we can see um, a difference and in the representation, we can see a spark here. So this is learned representations, which means quite good. And in the different downstream task, they do prediction is better than the benchmark. They do the classification better than the benchmark and uh, they do the anomaly detection is better than the benchmark. So this uh, is a good work that I wanna demonstrate that, okay, the beauty of the uh, pre-trained model based on the contrast, contrastive learning. So now uh, I will introduce quickly about uh, what we have done in this area. So, so far for us, uh, this is still our um, working paper. So that's why uh, I will only demonstrate some basic ideas, some basic settings. So here we are trying to solve a problem that is called uh, cringing. So I will introduce what's that. Okay, so this is a collaboration with a Chinese um, um, company that they have the sensors in the roadmap. And because the sensors is so expensive that it's not impossible to cover all the region. So alternatively, they only cover 80%, uh, sorry, 20% of the regions. And the rest, the 80% is un totally unobserved, unseen, uh, unseen locations. 
So how can we use, we observe the 20% um, percent data to infer outside of the box. That's why it's called, it's also called extrapolation to infer what could be the, for example, passenger flow or the traffic flow here. So the basic idea, maybe you will use the um, neighbors to, to infer this part. And just like what KNN is doing, right? So this is the first setting. And the second setting is that we also have the imputation um, per, uh, need. For example, uh, in, in imputation is what we call the intra. So inside, inside of the data set, some part is missing, we wanna um, uh, complete it. So uh, in our data, we also found out, okay, there are some days are purely missed. They are within uh, some day, there are also some block is missed. And also some, there are also some random element wise missed. So this may be because some super high temperature of in the, in the summer. So the connections of the sensors, it, it kind of shuts down. So this is the, this one. So we have the, creating task and the imputation task together. And that's why we want to use the uh, contrastive learning to learn a representation and do the two tasks at the same time. So um, to achieve um, this kind of goal, there are some several methods we can look at, for example, um, linear interpolation or um, matrix or tensor factorization or KNN. And there are also some learning based method. So, but here we will use the contrastive learning and this is the preliminary model design that because we have such a road network, right? Referring back to the metro station we mentioned before is a graph. So we first formulated as a graph, multi-view graph, since we have multiple graphs and we do the graph contrast that um, um, the positive pairs is the neighbors and the negative pairs is the non neighbors. And then we fit in, for example, the GCN to learn the embedding. So this is the um, graph contrast. And how can we do the uh, creating? How can we infer the, the place we, 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 we don't even observe? So this, we use the info NCE uh, again, this famous paper. How do we do that? So for example, we assume our sensor one to sensor 20 or maybe 80. Sensor one to sensor 80 is observed. And the sensor 81 to sensor 100 is unobserved. So we use the same setting. Okay, for sensor, um, we don't know which one is the real one. So we generate some random samples and then we maximize the similarities between the observed um, population with the unobserved one. So we, we learn the, 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 what's the real one. So this is the setting, like uh, this is the model design. And this is the, uh, some preliminary results that uh, for example, this is the uh, adjacency matrix for the shortest pass and this is for the connectivity. And this is what uh, the graph learned, the node representations, you can see kind of reflecting the reality, which means it's a good represent representation. And this is the uh, result we learned. So some part, um, so these three stations are totally unobserved in the training data and we directly uh, it only appears in the testing data. So we directly use the model to infer uh, what those stations gonna look like. So, so far you can see the result is quite promising so far. Um, so um, this one, um, I will stop for the first part is a really important concept has been introduced pre training contrastive learning. That's why we take more time and the rest and uh, the second part is continued with the same ide ideas. So it will be uh, more, uh, fa will be faster. So uh, the second part, we, yep. Sorry, Zue, but this is a, a question for the contrastive learning part. Um, mm -hmm. So 
it, when you define the positive uh, pairs and negative pairs, so yeah. like the definition or your assumptions, what is the positive negative really will directly uh, influence or have impact on your final result, right? In your... uh, you mean, what's the intuition of the definition of positive and negative pairs gonna have in the, in the, in the model um, performance, right? Yeah, I mean, for example, in your mm. root map, the, the application, you define the positive pairs to be the neighbors, the negative pairs to be yeah. like the non-neighbors, right? Mm -hmm. So this is this actually mm -hmm. comes from our human intuition. Yeah. And, th and this really, the definition of such like positive negative pairs will directly influence the quality of your representation. Exactly, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah. So then I have to say that so far, uh, this technique is from uh, computer vision and it is quite intuitive that why in the computer vision, their way to define the positive pairs is quite makes sense, right? Yeah. The yeah. same the same generated one. But indeed, I have to uh, admit that this is also the problem we have trying to answer all the time that, okay, why contrastive learning works in the uh, in the traffic data, it only works. But we we so far haven't been able to explain in detail that why. Okay, we 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 define the positive pair as the neighbors, non, um, negative as the number neighbors. Is our humans think this way? But why it works? It works, but why it works? It's not as intro, uh, um, intuitive as the the image data. Yeah. Indeed, I have to admit that. So I think. Um, we can refer back this question after the second paper because the second paper will kind of give some insight that how design, how to define the positive pairs, negative pairs will significantly uh, affect the result. So I think uh, we can refer back to this question after the second, uh, second half, second part. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's a really good question. Yeah. So the second part is we use the same technique, uh, self-supervised learning and contrastive learning, but for the trajectory data. So now uh, a quick review that, um, and the, the component, uh, we, the, the concept we, ha we haven't introduced is the, there are really two essential and important components in the traffic systems. One is road network, we already talked about it a lot, and another is the trajectory. This is the new so far for today. So the road network, for example, I get it from Atlanta. Mm. So road network basically can be formulated as a graph, right? With each road segment as a node and the edge is the connections between the two road segments. So we formulate it as a graph and it's static. And when we learn it, we learn the um, uh, road segment uh, the each node representation. So what we call is a local scale because we only look at one node, each node. For trajectory, for example, uh, from node one goes to node two goes to node three. So this is this one is a sequence. So it's different. It is not a graph anymore. It's a sequence and it's dynamic like this one. It's moving. Mm. And then when we learn representation, it's like in the NLP, the whole sentence, we learn a representation. So it's a global scale, a scale. So this is the property of the two components. So what has been done, this is an overview about what has been done for the road segment representation and trajectory representation. So road segment uh, representation basically collect the features of distance hierarchies, intersections, and the functional similarities of each node, and then use uh, some encoding modules, for example, GCN and, and GNN. And if the two nodes are the neighbors in the graph, this is our assumption, then their representation will be close uh, to each other in the embedding space. And for this representation, there are some corresponding downstream tasks, for example, to label different node, a uh, different road, whether it's highway or, or small, small uh, uh, alley. So it's like a classification. And for the speed, 
uh, inference because the traffic speed is also uh, road segment by segment, right? And another type is trajectory representation that we have such a sequence, we learn a embedding for this sequence and then it's in the embedding space. If we have another similar trajectory, then the embedding will be close to this one. And for the trajectory, the typical model is the sequence model, for example, RNN, LSTM, and the transformer. And the corresponding downstream task is, for example, trajectory similarity search or travel time estimation, because travel time is involve a trajectory from here to here, right? So this is the overview. But so far, the, the current work has been treated either the road network or trajectory separately, those only research uh, road network and those only research trajectory. So they do it separately and independently and ignore the interrelation between these two components. And our model, our this new model, trying to bridge this, this gap. So what kind of interrelations we are talking about? So this is the road network, right? So the trajectory has, uh, so the road network, the topology of the road network constrains the mobility of the trajectory, that the trajectory cannot go out, out, outside of the road network, right? So this is one. The second is the trajectory and uh, vice versa, the trajectory's traveling patterns will reflect back some semantic dependence of the road segments. So here I will give an example that, um, okay, the node A and B, as you can see uh, from the road network, uh, this uh, black dotted line, they are far away to each other. So which means they should get a different in embedding. But from the trajectory wise, you can see A and B, they are frequently traveled by this kind of highway, the purple, super dark purple one, which means um, they should get the similar embedding from the trajectory wise. Then you can see these two components, they are offering a complementary information of A and B. So that's why to, uh, to uh, formulate them together is important. So there are some current work trying to combine the two together, but basically uh, they just do two steps. The first step to learn the road embedding uh, and then use in the trajectory. For example, like this, use the POI and the neighbors and apply it in the trajectory. Or vice versa, they learn the trajectory embedding and use inside of the road network. So this kind of two ways, um, two, two step method. So first of all, you will suffer from suffer, uh, suffer from error propagation. The error from the first step will be brought to the second step. And also deep down, if we look at each step, it's basically just learn, learn it separately. It still haven't tried to build the uh, correlation between the two. So which means we call it still doing the within scale, only in the scale of the uh, road segment or only in the scale of trajectory. So this is the drawback. So our solution, then of course we wanna cross scale, which means cross the two module and uh, two, two modes to do the contrast. So how do we do that? So surprise, surprise, <laughs> of course, we use the contrastive learning module, uh, con contrastive learning uh, framework. But the question, the same question, how do we do the three things, data augmentation, positive pairs, and the contrastive uh, loss for trajectory? So here is our, um, uh, here is another uh, insights that um, this is an area called uh, graph self-supervised learning. It basically do the self-supervised learning specifically for the graph data. So inside of graph self-supervised learning, there are also two concepts, which is called node node contrast. That means, okay, how, how do we contrast the two nodes? They are in the same level. So basically um, we have multi-views. If this node cross the different view, if they are the same node, we can define it really strictly. If they are same node, then it's the positive. If it's the different node, then it's negative. 
So this is the quite um, strictly defined, but we still follow this idea that in our data, can we also do the node node contrast for the road segment? And also maybe we do the trajectory trajectory contrast for the trajectory. So we borrow this idea first. And in the graph self supervised learning, there's also cross scale contrast, which we contrast the node, the single node, and the whole graph. So how do we do that? So basically, the node is called the positive pairs for this graph if this node is inside of this graph. So basically, this uh, really intuitive design. So similarly, can we do the same? That if the road segment is inside of the trajectory, then we call it positive. Otherwise, it's no. Yeah, we can we can try that. So, so this is the three um, point we mentioned. Okay, for the road road contrast, we basically have two views. For example, the structure view and some functional view. Or here we use transitional view. Um, and for the contrast. We basically use the one hop neighbors as the positive samples. So they are the positive nodes for this S1. And the loss is then quite, you know, quite straightforward that if and this is the mutual information, we try to maximize the uh, mutual information. So this SJ is the neighbors of SI. So all the SJ are positive samples. We, we are trying to maximize the mutual information between the SI representation and SJ representation. So this is the first loss. So for the trajectory is um, more a little bit more complicated that, okay, this is a, a sequence. How do we uh, get the positive samples for this uh, trajectory? So we do this way. Um, we do augmentation, for example, we let it D2 a little bit, or we randomly drop some nodes, uh, or we swap some, some node uh, order. So all different type of uh, argu augmentation technique, and we get a, a, a set. This set we call it is the, they are all positive samples. So the second type is like, right like this. So our original tau i and our augmented tau i primes, here should be tau prime. This is the positive samples. We maximize the mutual information between the two. So the third type, and I think um, I, um, is the most important, is how we do the cross contrast between the road segment and the trajectory. So we have two, uh, we can follow the, the basic design first that, okay, if the node is inside of this graph, then it's called positive um, pair, right? So we follow this basic design that, okay, in our case, if this road segment is passed by, by this, um, by this uh, trajectory, then this node and this trajectory is called positive pairs. So correspondingly, we write the third loss term as this way. If the SI belongs to the tau J, then they are positive, then we maximize their mutual information. So this is a really um, simple design and it may be not reflecting the, the, the reality. So why? Because in the reality, when we travel from this S origin to this S destination. If this SI is close enough in our shortest path. So sometimes we also, when we really choose, we, we sometimes we also detour a little bit. We, we don't really exactly follow the shortest path, right? So which means those segments that is close enough to the trajectory could also be seen or regarded as the potential alternative route that we can go, which means they can also be regarded as the positive samples, right? So in that case, for example, our positive samples is not anymore the node inside of the black trajectory, but it's a soft distributed region that this whole region, this red area 
they are all the positive samples. So then we define a specific weight. It measures uh, the length of the, the, the original trajectory uh, tau and the detoured tau prime that we need to pass the SI. This is tau prime and plus the distance between the SI to the tau. So if the SI is closer and closer to the trajectory, then this weight, as you can see, will become bigger and bigger. So in this case, uh, we select, we let all the sam uh, all the nodes, all the road segments as the positive samples, but with a weight that if you are closer to the node, the weight is higher, otherwise it's lower. So instead of just choose one specific um, positive pairs, we choose a soft distribution, a soft weight. So this is kind of introduce some noise inside of the positive sample selection. And this, theoretically, you should make the representation more robust. And here, I think you uh, kind of answer your question, Shan uh, Chong, about the selection of the of the positive and negative pairs. And we can see some results. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So here is a quick recap, a quick re compare that our new design of this uh, cross contrast that uh, all the samples and uh, the, the set, they are positive samples. The difference is that it's weighted. Compared to the simple design, that this SI has to be inside of the uh, trajectory tau j, so that you will be, uh, only in this case, you will be positive samples. So you can see that uh, one is really strict different, one is more soft de designed, these two ways. So in the end, this is the total loss, uh, segment, segment, trajectory, trajectory, and the segment to trajectory, these three contrastive loss. So we answer all the questions, now, this is the overall the whole um, um, the whole uh, framework that um, once again the contrastive learning and the self supervised learning is not a model. It's not a machine learning model. It's only a, a a learning scheme, a learning framework. The real model, for example, for the road, if we want to learn the embedding, we need to use, for example, the graph attention network. Um, to learn the nodes embedding for, for, for each node. And for the trajectory, we want to learn the embedding for the trajectory. We use the, uh, the sequence model, for example, RNN or LSTM. And here we use the transformer encoder. So these are real, uh, the, the, the model we use. So this is the experiment setup. We train it in three and data set. Xi'an, Chengdu, and the one I didn't list is the portal. They have different road segments, edges, and the trajectory length. And this is the result. So in the road segment-based task, but by the way, all, all this result, I think it doesn't bring too much information because we always demonstrate a good result, right? So uh, the result is always gonna show the model is better. So not that much uh, in interesting information, but um, Okay, in the road segment, in the road segment based task, for example, label uh, classification or speed inference, of course, the um, performance is better. And in the trajectory based task, it's also better performance. So you can see the same model, different tasks, different data. So we can use just the same model and you achieve all the performance gain. Now, the most important, usually, um, the oblation study is the experiment we can see really fun, interesting insights. Okay, so this is trying to answer. We designed so many different uh, contrasts. Which one contribute more? And which one contribute less? And why? So here, we, we will give some uh, our, our understanding. So for the road segment task, Imagine that the, the road segment is so sparse and so uh, is the discrete is, um, and sparse. So by nature, it doesn't have so much, um, how to say, the, the meaning inside, the semantic meaning inside. So for, for this uh, road segment related task, 
So what we are doing here is that, okay, this is our proposed model. Oblation study means that we drop out some component one by one. We say how worse the situation is gonna be. So the F1 score is always the higher, the better, the lower, the, the worse. So we, you can say that, okay, surprisingly, the cross contrast between the segment and the trajectory is the contributing the most for the road uh, segment learning. Why? Because the road segment, as we mentioned before, it doesn't have so much information, but instead the trajectory has the most uh, semantic meaning, really abundant. So that's why this part contribute the most for the, for the road segment. And the second contributor is of course the segment segment itself. This is the first takeaway. For the trajectory task, since the trajectory itself has enough uh, semantic meanings, so that's why the, the biggest contributor is the trajectory trajectory, okay? And the second is actually the weight design. If we uh, this, uh, threw away this weight, um, the, the performance will drop really bad, which means the soft selection of the positive pairs introduce some noise into the positive samples, which make the, 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 the um, representation more robust. And here's the visualization. So you can see that, okay, this is in the pre-training part that uh, our model learned the um, uh, representation vectors in a more um, evenly distributed way and this uniformity means a more robust representations um, than, than the benchmark. And in the downstream task, in the classified layer, um, our embedding becomes more um, distinguished. That this is yellow, this is um, red. So this makes the classifier easier yeah, compared to the benchmark models. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear. Um, so I'm wondering how do you judge this is like more robust because so this is like a 2D visualization, right? So um, yeah. maybe in 3D, they might be still like well separated, but in 2D, it doesn't look well separated. Do you, do you have another way to judge robustness of, of those embeddings? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, here we use the TNSE to do the visualization. So TNSE basically we input all the high dimensional data, of course, more than three dimensions, but you just kind of show it in a best way uh, in the 2D way. And of course in the 3D, it will be different. So we haven't checked that, but indeed um, I can keep it down how we can, yeah, the robustness is not easy to quantify. So, so I have to admit that. So here we just use the, the typical tools and the T, uh, TNSE to, to, to do the visualization. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, this part indeed has some limitations. Yeah, yeah I because, that. because I sometimes realized when you plot it in 2D TSNE, you can also plot in 3D. And sometimes mm -hmm. in 3D, the separation is nice, but in 2D, it seems not as well yeah. separated. Yeah, I, so that's kind of like yeah, a basic problem of those. Yeah. Yes, yes. But, but yes, yeah, we have Thank the you. same problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a good point, yeah. Yeah, P please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So a quick uh, recap so far that we introduced uh, how we use the contrastive learning for the um, road segment and uh, trajectory co-learning. So uh, we define the positive pairs and negative pairs by different uh, augmentation scheme to learn a more general uh, representation. So now we move to the last part. Um, it's quite different from the previous two and it's a little bit, uh, since the traffic management is kind of a different uh, type of domain now. So I, we will focus on the traffic signal control uh, in this specific, super specific area. So there are some, a lot of domain knowledge um, involved. So I will try to explain it as clear as possible. So, so for the traffic signal control, so we need to think uh, within ourselves, for example, five, uh, two seconds, 
what he is doing, uh, what what's the traffic light is doing, how 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 what kind of mathematical problem is trying to solve. So so here we we will explain it, uh, one by one. So so what's the goal of the traffic signal control? Of course, you're trying to maximize the flow going through or minimize the congestions, right? If we formulate it in a um, in, a, in a mathematical way, then what's the decision variable we want to do? So you have two cases. For example, in the uh, single intersection, um, one is called a cycle lens, which means uh, our uh, traffic light uh, turn red, green, and yellow different seconds combined together. In our case, the cycle lens is 20, uh, uh, 83 seconds. So this is the first variable to learn. And the second is called the green light ratio. For example, this is 70 divided by 83. So this is green light ratio. So these two need to be defined. And in the multi-intersection uh, scenario, we have A in the uh, upstream, B in the downstream. So the, we need to define an additional um, variable called the offset that uh, after A, finish the right light, the car will travel how, how much time, maybe 10 seconds later, the B will turn the green light on. So the gap between A and B's green light, this is called offset. So this is the decision variables. And usually people formulate it as the operations OR problem. Some use the rule base to get some analytical solutions. So a lot of the uh, transportation engineering techniques involved, but um, all the math mathematics uh, is based on the assumption that our data is static. So it has some constraints. Although it has some constraints, but it works really well. So two really famous systems, one is called a SCAS, um, uh, it's called a uh, Fulton Sydney and Coordinate Adaptive Traffic System, one is good from UK. So these two systems almost uh, account for 70% of the market share uh, about traffic light control. So they basically have this closed form that, um, okay, this is the uh, flow rate. Higher flow rate means a longer uh, uh, cycle length. So this is the basic assumption, basic uh, intuition. But as we mentioned before, this uh, traditional way is really static and really um, and not, not flexible. So maybe we wanna try something more uh, learning-based method. Um, then of course, um, reinforcement learning comes to our mind. So um, reinforcement learning uh, was the basic uh, understanding and basic in intuition is that we have two um, important agent and uh, environment. So the agent received the information, observation from the environment, and based on the observation, you take an action. And this action usually change the environment as well. And we also get receive the immediate feedback, for example, reward. Um, since we change the environment, we get the new observation, we take new actions, we get new feedback. So this is kind of a uh, loop. So uh, here, I think maybe I will spend one super quick minute to demonstrate uh, what, what is reinforcement learning doing. For example, this is a maze, uh, five times five. This is the environment. And the action, um, the, the red dot starts from here, okay, zero, zero. The, 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 the red dot can take four actions up, down, left, right, and the goal is get to the exit, the green part. So we can, and what we need to learn for the reinforcement learning is basically to take which action at uh, which state, which we call it a policy. So for example, a really basic, basic policy we can get for this one. Uh, oh, I don't know what's wrong with this one. But the basic one is we take the action evenly, right? So for different actions, we do a uniform random draw. And you can see how it works like this. So it took really long time um, 
sometimes I wait for up to five minutes until this one gets to the get to the result. Hope hope this time it will be fast. Oh, oh yes, yeah. So this time is faster. Yeah. So but still not optimal. So um, reinforcement learning is basically uh, I will run this really fast. It's basically trying to. learn the best um op and the best how to say the best policy as soon as possible based on the value the q value for example q value and here our reward is defined this way every step we made is minus one reward which means we are losing our life for example the longer we work which means the longer loss we the, the higher loss we get and once we reach here the, the the reward is zero is uh, is at, at least non negative so you can see uh, this is the q value the the loss function uh, or the uh, or the accumulative uh, loss along the way and you can see here is the furthest part that's why the value is the lowest because we need to go all the way um to the exit and here you can see the exit the the value is the the, the highest is zero. So basically it's trying to learn the policy like this one. Okay, and here we need to go down, 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 go right, right, up, right, right, down, and then we reach the goal. So this is a, a, a really a toy example about uh, reinforcement learning. So uh, I think this, you can understand the action observation feedback better. So reinforcement learning can be also used in another, surprisingly, another uh, a lot of interesting domains. So this might be interesting for, for, for the audience from the uh, uh, logistic or the general transportation uh, domain. That in the, for example, in the OR, a lot of problem is formulated as the integer programming or mixed integer programming problem. And the reinforcement learning has been proved being able to solve the um, IP problem or MIP problem way faster. So uh, they use the reinforcement learning to do the cutting plane algorithm. So I will skip the detail. And also in the, uh, in the 3D packing problem, how we put uh, which uh, item in which XYZ location. So this is also can be solved by this reinforcement learning. So it surprisingly has a lot of uh, applications, not only in the autom uh, autonomous, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, the AV, yeah, the automatic, uh, autonomous driving, yeah. So not only that. So back to our case, okay, the RL um, is based on the Markov decision process that we are in the state one, we take the action one, we get the result um, reward one, and then we switch to uh, um, uh, state two and action two, reward two. So it's this kind of uh, algorithm and uh, this same kind of process. So in the, R, uh, in the traffic signal control, there are all different type of um, way to define the state, for example, Q length, traffic volume, uh, current signal, and a different way to define the reward as well. Usually they are the similar, Q length, wait time, um, delay time, blah, blah. And for the action, we introduced the, um, the how to say, the decision variables before. Um, but now the action usually they call, we have a cyclic one and a cyclic one. So I will introduce uh, here in detail more, but here, uh, and we need to go through this uh, domain knowledge again, uh, which is called uh, the movement conflict matrix and the phase conflict matrix. So what is that? So it means that, okay, when the traffic light is releasing, it's not just releasing one direction, you will release multiple non-conflicting directions at the same time. So this is the complete matrix is doing. For example, we have the full approach North, South, East, West, and the different movement and turn left going straight and the turn right. Usually the turn right doesn't need traffic signals. So we, we don't need to take care of that. So then we only have eight 
movement directions we need to uh, take care. The conflict matrix here basically means that, okay, for example, this going straight cannot be released with these 10 left at the same time because they will crash here. So that's why this block is, uh, is black. So once we finish the whole matrix, we will find out, okay, there are eight different um, blocks that is non-conflict. For example, one and five. So one is this one, five is this one. They can be released together. So this A, B, C, D, F, G, we call it a phase. And for this eight phase, we can do the same to see whether is either each two phases, whether they are conflict or not. And now, by the speaking of the uh, actions, uh, there are two ways uh, or three ways. One is called a cyclic. Uh, is mainly used, for example, in uh, Australia, uh, States, UK, or Hong Kong. A cyclic means that, okay, we have eight phase, right? So basically we fix the phase order after one is always B, after B is always C. Then what we need to decide is, okay, the, how long for the A? Maybe 100 for A, 70 uh, for B, and it's 120 for C. Depends on their uh, traffic situation. So for the uh, cyclic, it's different, different logic that no matter A, B, C, D, F, G, we only give them 10 seconds, for example. Then when we are making a decision, at each time point, we need to decide, okay, we pick which 10 seconds. For example, now the A is super crowded. We give the 10 seconds to release A. And if it's still not fully released, we give 10 more seconds for A. And then if it's released, then maybe next one, we choose another phase. So you can see uh, this type uh, is, is more like a to, to choose different phase at each timestamp. And in Germany, it's kind of uh, quite even more flexible. You combine these two way together. So now a quick question that um, if we, um, um, yeah, let me see. That um, mm, uh, I wanna see how, how, you can understand, uh, how you understand this problem. So I will, also sent maybe in the chat. Oh, can you click this no, uh, this link? Uh, sorry, it's not in the chat yet. Okay, let me see how can, maybe I need to. Can you just uh, copy paste it uh, in the chat so everyone can see it? Yeah, I need to stop sharing first and then I put in the chat. Okay, now I should be able to see. Yeah. So a, a, a quick question then, which way you think is easier to be formulated as reinforcement learning? Um, one is acyclic, uh, one is cyclic, another is uh, acyclic. So I will just run and choose one. Okay, we have half, half. Uh, uh, so still the ma majority uh, gets right, uh, a cyclic is better. Uh, why? Uh, it's basically the difference is whether our action space is continuous or discrete. For this cyclic one is continuous, for example, from 10, 10 seconds all the way to 200 seconds, it's quite big decision, pro decision space versus the a, a cyclic one is basically um, we choose one from the eight potential phase. So it, the decision uh, is way smaller. Okay. So now back to this one. Uh, there's a famous uh, framework, it's called a FRAP. It's to use this uh, phase, uh, uh, phase selection way because uh, it's based in, the, based in the state, the team. So what it's doing is basically collect the for example, the demand information for each movement and combine it as the face embedding. This is the face embedding. And then they, they put the eight faces pairwise eight times eight, except themselves. So that's why it's eight times seven. So this, we get a tensor. 
and then use the face competition mask to mask those unvisible, invisible one, and then use the Q learning to learn the the last famous the last important score. This score is each score for each face. Uh, the highest score will be picked, will be selected for next time. So in this case, they will um, make the decision. And intuitively, higher demand um, will be more likely to be picked because it will have higher score. So, but the problem is um, that, um, okay, that uh, the current work, they all train the model in scenario one and then they use it, deploy it in scenario one. And uh, you cannot, you, if we deal with scenario two, it cannot work well in scenario two. So uh, then, for example, we have so many different cities. Do we have, again, uh, each city different RL model? Then we are proposing a temporary solution that um, can we co-train the different cities together, get a general model, and then we can easily adapt to a new city. So this is our uh, 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 wishful thinking, <laughs> but uh, the biggest uh, the drawback, uh, the challenge is that in different cities, the different intersections has really then uh, flexible um, structures. Some are three ways, some are four ways, some are four ways with some angle, some have different numbers of lanes, and the, the lanes can be the combination of right through left together also all different combinations so the the complexity can be this type of this number of scenarios times this number of intersections approaches now and the lens so quite complex and uh, what was the current researchers doing they have to use the <laughs> heavy manual label work to label each uh, intersections which is quite a, a, a huge headache so um, we propose um, a general plugin module that um, basically the idea is that map all different types of cities intersections into a standard uh, for uh, the cross uh, crossroad. And I will skip some technical de detail because we also add some like um, how to say the 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 rule based algorithms to do the general plugin module. And such that we can unify uh, to define the state and actions for different cities. So this one um, is, uh, I will just uh, introduce the intuition because the details will involve a lot of um, uh, rule-based uh, domain knowledge. So after this plugin module, then we can co-train these different scenarios together. And we will directly reuse the FRAP module and then we will use another actor critic, which is uh, able to coach in different uh, scenarios together, this uh, reinforcement learning module for this, for, for learn, for choosing the next phase. So here is the map, I will skip that. So, but uh, how to train the model? It's impossible to really use a real city to train the model at the same time, right? Otherwise, but the, the, the city will gonna, gonna have some, a big mess. So uh, in the reinforcement learning, we always need to train everything in the, uh, in the simulation. So this is the specific simulation for transportation, specifically for traffic signal control. We have this four times four, five times five, and another four times four uh, city. And we also have one Ingolstadt in Germany and a Cologne in Germany. And we have two cities in uh, China. Uh, one is in Shenzhen, we built on our own. And one is in Shaoxing, we built on our own. So in total, we have seven different uh, scenarios. So this is the result. So you can see that co-train, and this is our co-training, is most of the time, it's better than the, the benchmark method. They are all single scenario trained. Uh, this fulfill our assumption. And more, most importantly is this result that we, for example, we train in six scenarios, except uh, this grid four times four. And we use the model from the, the previous six scenarios 
directly applied in these unobserved scenarios, this we call it transfer. Even our transfer result, you can see is better than the baseline. So this is really surprising that our transfer can even um, perform, outperform the single train model. And here is some demos that you can see uh, some, um, this is our model. Some, the benchmark, they already get uh, quite queued up here. Congestion already happens, but ours is uh, still quite um, strong. And if you look at a single, um, a single intersection, you can see that, uh, okay, um, queue up already, but we can release it really um, fast. This is our model. And in the clone scenario, we have the same. And here is super tiny. We can't see too much, but the contrast happens in this corner. So we max, uh, we zoom in. You can see that. You can see that. Okay, and uh, that may be happening around here. Here, maybe here. Yeah, you can see here is already queue up. But uh, we can we also queue up because quite a high demand. But we can release it quite timely. So um, there are some more insights from the experiment. So the first question is: Does always more scenarios to be co trained uh, the the better? So far in our setting, our um, experiment, yes, we start from this uh, ankle um, scenario. Based on that, we add two more scenarios. We gain four um, percent. We add another more, another two more. So in total of four, we gain thirty percent. We add six more, so we gain forty uh, percent. So you can see is a huge uh, step, a huge uh, upward step here, but it kind of um, marginally dying down. So there's um, there is a, a upper bound of the best performance we can achieve. Now the last question we want to answer is that okay, why multi scenario co training is better? Why? So we will start from this uh, example that uh, this is the uh, uh, Fengling Road. It's basically a corridor uh, going straight, so that this agent, if it's single train, the only most of the car is going um, going straight. So if it happen, if congestion happens, then more likely they they go straight. So then the agent is learned such way that to prioritize uh, releasing the going straight line first. That's why you can see the ten left line here on the on the upper side. The ten left line uh, line has the congestions because the 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 agent didn't learn the pattern. Instead, if we co-train the model, we have seen more diverse situation from the other data set. So it knows how to balance. So this is the reason that the agent in the single scenario couldn't see more diverse data pattern. So that's why they are prone to get stuck in the or local optima. So this work, uh, we, um, we also open some discussions and uh, looking for your ideas because we submit to a conference, it's called iClear. We got a, a accept, a full accept from the reviewers, but we got rejected by the, by the, by the uh, editor. So the, we are currently revising this work and we are welcoming for any good um, uh, suggestion, uh, con contrast, uh, really constructive uh, ideas. So um, a summary that um, no matter how our data look like, um, metro stations, trajectories, or trajectories on the road, our model, even in the first lecture, the density conversation, we are learning ABC. This ABC can also be seen as a latent representation, right? No matter whether it's density conversation or this CNN or the self-supervised learning, they are all trying to learn um, uh, this general embedding. And the difference is just whether the embedding is good or bad. And the self-supervised learning uh, and the, the other technique is trying 
they all try to solve the same goal to improve the embedding. For example, we add the rough Laplacian penalty on in the U to make the 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 U reflecting the graph structure more to make it better. And similarly, the data augmentation, or even in the reinforcement learning, we put different scenarios to coach and together. The, the whole thing is try, just trying to learn the representation better. Yeah, so this is the whole thing, the whole uh, logic behind. And, but there are still some unobserved, uh, unsolved problems. For example, um, a really a city-wide data set is usually is really rare um, because in the real city there a lot there are usually the multi-mode of transportation methods or means. For example, we already studied the metro, the uh, the the subways. There are also bus. There are also taxis or DD or Uber. There are also private cars, private drivers, and in Germany there are also a lot of e-scooters. But none of this um, the transportation mode has a full observation of the whole city transportation. So can we combine all those heterogeneous data together, multi-mode data together? If yes, how can we utilize this multi-mode heterogeneous data? So there's a work from Facebook called uh, data, uh, data to Vector you use the speech data, audio data, and the text data, all different data to embed into a vector. So maybe that can offer a solution. And similarly, in the trajectory, and we only look at the trajectory on, uh, on the road network for the cars, but maybe uh, a really person, uh, I will work first or take the e-scooter to take the bus first and then transfer uh, at a metro station and then get off and then drive my own car or get a taxi to, to reach the destination. So it's the full whole life um, trajectory of the day. Then in that case, can we also utilize the multi-mode heterogeneous data? And how can we connect different trajectory together for the same person? There's a technique called the person re-ID. And if we can connect, how can we protect the privacy at the same time? Maybe federated learning can give the, get the answer. So this is still some open questions. So overall, uh, I will stop here. Um, and uh, we are, uh, I'm running uh, 10 minutes uh, more uh, late. So thank you. And, and uh, your feedback and the thoughts are highly appreciated. And I create a Google form that you can feel free to give any uh, thoughts. So thank you. Thank you. You, you, you are more